Thank you, Kristen. Good morning. It's a privilege for me to welcome you here this morning. All of you who I can see, and also to extend welcome to all of you who are tuned in by a variety of electronic means. It's good to have you here. <clears throat> Shall we pray? Lord God, we welcome you here this morning among us as we welcome each other. And we also thank you that this isn't the only place where you meet with us because you are with us each and every one all of the time, whether we like it or not. Bless our fellowship together this morning in Jesus' name, amen. If you have an announcement, would you come up right now and make it? The Outdoor Space Task Force has been diligently working. Uh, one of the things is, is researching solar panels, their impact, the cost, the placement ideas, and they would like to have an informational meeting with all of you next Sunday after church. It's not in the bulletin, so make a note of it, um, to be able to share what they have found and the proposal that they would uh, that they are bringing to us as a congregation. ZLT has heard the proposal as well and are supporting moving forward with sharing the information. And then there will be a congregational vote on our regular meeting, which will be May 7th. But we want you to have a chance to ask questions and try to learn more about the details next Sunday before the actual um, vote at the congregational meeting. Also, if you see any of the members of the task force, their names are in the bulletin, please give them thanks for their hard work uh, in the research that they've been doing so far. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andy Colomb. Uh, I'm one of the elders. And so um, if Kara Crop, could you please stand up? She is another one of our elders. And then it looks like Dave Yoder is not here, but he is our third elder. So uh, just wanted to kind of remind many of you of like what the elders do. I know several of you have served on the elder board at some time over the life of Zion. Um, so this is from the, the role of the elder. So we work with pastors to oversee and implement ministries pertaining to the spiritual and relational life, care and guidance of the congregation which may include counseling, conflict transformation, preaching, teaching, church life, and worship rituals. We consult with and advise pastors in matters of pastoral and congregational care that require oversight and confidentiality. We work with pastors to discern new direction, ministries, and practices necessary for changing needs while maintaining consistency with Zion's vision and to discern and discontinue activities that are no longer needed nor helpful in consultation with the leadership table and the congregation. And we connect with people from the congregation and spend much of our time praying for folks. So just kind of wanted to give a rundown a little bit and uh, let you know that if you have any concerns or comments, you can always uh, reach out to one of the elders as well as the pastoral uh, team. So thank you. I spent some time being an elder when I was younger. Now I'm too old to be an elder. <laughs> but I'm impressed. There were as many as 10 or 11 elders when I was doing it. And now our elders are expert enough, three of them can do the job. <laughs> That's great. Well, worship, worship is a conscious activity. It's a deliberate activity. So we need to set our hearts, our minds, 
our eyes, our ears, and our voices to this task of worship. Today we're continuing to think about and study the aftermath of Easter. And Easter and the things that happen after Easter are largely about miracle. We're a very diverse group here, and that's a good thing, I believe. God is good at diversity, and God intends for diversity. So when it comes to miracles, we react very differently as people, as individuals, to the idea of miracles. There are Marys among us that readily accept miracles. And there are Thomases among us who are very skeptical when confronted with a miracle claim. And that's okay. But we continue to work with that issue today. Let's sing. Please turn to number 25 in Hymnal of Worship Book, the blue one. Number 25. And if you are able, would you please stand? to 283 283 Christ who lived his holy and the Lord was slain now is free 
Kristen, would you play through that song once? Number 335. 335. Our good sister Karen Amstutz is here with us again today, and she's agreed to come and share with us about her continuing work in Bolivia. Karen? Good morning. For those who don't know me, I'm Karen Amstutz, and I um, <clears throat> grew up here at Zion. And guess what? 50 years ago, 50 years ago, I went to Bolivia with MCC, and um, it was in 1973. And I met my husband there, Wendell Amstutz, who was from Heston, Kansas. And um, we liked it there and wanted to stay there and live with the people after our MCC term. And so we married here and then went back and served under Mennonite Mission Network. And then um, five years ago, we went back after being here for 15 years with my father, Ken Berkey. And um, we've been there now for five years. We wanted to go back to live in a community. We live in a small rural community where we first went when we were married. And um, we have uh, um, around a 12 acre orchard, citrus orchard and pasture land for a few cows. And um, <clears throat> we're living in a, in a small community. So there's a lot of dynamics of community development and um, Wendell was right away um, appointed to work with the water system in the community. It comes from a falls that's up, up the hill a ways. And um, so that's a big, a big task for him right now. And um, we're also um, striving to um, 
work on environmental issues that we have in the area and get people on board to, to be conscious and oriented in that area. I also teach a literacy class, so that keeps me busy, and we're part of a small congregation of around um, 30, 30 persons that come, children and, and adults. And um, 25 years ago, we started in El Dordno, Bolivia. It's about three miles from where we live. In the town of El Dordno, we started a, a senior center. It's a day center. And today, I wanted to give you an update about that. And I brought some pictures for that. So this is the team that directs the program. People come every day for um, a meal and for health care and for having fun together. And so this is the team. Sulma Becerra is our, our administrator. She's on the far left where the dog is, her friend. And then um, there's a, there are cooks and nurses and um, a cleaning lady, the president of the, of the elderly, and then volunteers for agriculture and, and other things. But, this is the, a wonderful team that is there every day. And this little kiosk is uh, supporting the soup kitchen that we have. That, so people come to the center every day, especially for eating. And um, this little kiosk sells fresh fruit juices and empanadas. And so it's on the corner of the main plaza. There's only one plaza in El Torno, so it's, it belongs to the town, to the city, but um, we're using it and it is uh, generating enough support for the needs of the soup kitchen. Coming to the center is a place where people find joy. And um, Mondays is dedicated to telling a Bible story. There's a pastor, a young pastor, Ernesto, who comes to tell stories, and then they color afterwards, and that's a, a fun activity for them. Bingo is a big day, too. And there's probably around 150 elderly that come during the week. And Marcelino, on this picture here, I thought it was so special. He has five cards. One is for him and four are for his friends who don't yet um, can't move as fast as he can with bingo. And so that's a beautiful picture with the colorful rocks. And memory, good exercise. Once a week, there's health care, and especially for a lot of diabetes is in the in the group of people, but this is um, a, an activity that we see every week, and it's washing feet and um, taking care of your feet, massages, and health care. And most people come walking, so that's great for their health, and some come on bikes. Eugenia, she's 82 years old and she volunteers in the kitchen. There's probably a group of around 10 women who volunteer in the kitchen. It's actually not inside the kitchen, but it's on the porch of the kitchen where there's a big table where they peel potatoes and cut carrots and um, get the, the dinner ready. And Marcial is giving advice to his friend, encouraging him. Tiborcio. There's a garden at the center. It doesn't supply all the that they need for the kitchen, but it's a, a therapy for the people, and um, a lot of a lot of the elderly were agri um, from rural areas working in agriculture, so they're retired, and this is a, a wonderful therapy for them. And um, Maritza, 68 years old, she's there with her daughter, Mari, and um, she also volunteers for the kitchen, and she's just a wonderful, friendly lady. So if you come to visit, you'll get a big hug from her. And this is the group that supports. Um, we're in and out during the week, and some of us are there every day, and we get together every 
couple months to oversee the program that it, to see that it's going well. And uh, we have, um, if you're on Facebook, we have a Centro de Ancianos Vida Feliz page, and you can go there and keep updated on the activities. I don't see all the pictures because I'm not on Facebook, but um, it's just an update of the activities at the center, and that's how you can get in contact. And this is, um, I brought this because I thought it was important that Zion, who has been a, a support for the Senior Center for many years, especially through the quilt show and through fundraisers that we've had here at Zion. Um, Zion and Calvary and Rock of Salvation, Lindell from, from Virginia, have, um, have contributed 15% 50, it says here. <clears throat> 2% from the local churches in El Torno. They especially cover the, the salary for the chaplain. And 20% um, comes from the Bolivian government. Uh, we have a full-time nurse, and um, she's paid by the government, and then they get food subsidies from the government, and then from the state, they, we get food rations. It's mostly, mostly white. Carbs, so it would be noodles and rice and sugar and oil, and and then 23% um, on the other side comes from local people, and a lot of meat and vegetables and um, I don't know it comes from uh, local people, and that's also um, helps pay for food services and equipment. And then the uh, Centro Vida Feliz CV, CVF is 15% 50, for the program generated by the kiosk. And um, the elderly, they pay a Boliviano every day for their meal. So, and then we have a lot of fundraising events, especially on Mother's Day and Father's Day. And um, in El Torno, the government also helps pay, cover the water and three salaries for persons who are volunteering there. So that's just a, an, an over um, see of, the, of how the finances are managed. And I want to thank you, Zion, for um, your continued support with us. And um, I believe this is a place where the kingdom of God is in action. And that's where we experience it in El Torno, Bolivia. Thank you, Karen. Vida Feliz, the good, happy life at El Torno, the turn in the river, right? Thank you. I'd like to offer a prayer now for our offerings. Lord God, we are your creations and everything that we have and are is a gift from you. And so this morning we bring our gifts, large gifts, widows mites, and we know that you bless them all. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let's stand and greet everybody and pass the peace of Jesus.
lost the battery on the other one. But I will fix that. And this one can stay here. Okay, let's sing again. Please turn the same book, the blue one. 269. 269. If you want to stand again, you can, but you don't have to. Over to 277. 277. Shall the Lord 
Good morning and welcome. Did everybody have a good week? Yeah. What were some highlights? <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I think we all kind of remember what big thing happened last Sunday, right? What was it? Easter, good, good. Um, I wanted to kind of do another little form of telling the Easter story again this Sunday because I believe we don't just celebrate it one Sunday a year. So um, I have these little, um, I don't know what you consider them, I guess, wooden figurines that I always set up every year for Easter um, around my house. Um, and so it came with a little storybook that I'll kind of read through and we can kind of go through the pieces with it. I got it right here. So it's called the Jesus Lives Bible Story. So after Jesus died on the cross, some women who knew and cared for him went to see the tomb where he had been buried. They brought spices to anoint his body. So I think that would be this little lady here and this one, we'll say, okay? So they're heading out to sea. But when they arrived, there was a loud noise and the earth shook. Can we make a loud noise? <laughs> yeah, loud noise. <laughs> Good, yep, big loud noise. Then an angel in white appeared right here and the guard who had been uh, guarding the tomb fell down in fear fell down and the stone blocking the entrance was rolled away so we'll roll the stone away kind of like the good old song we sing here and it fell on the guard. yeah it did fall on the guard yeah we'll say that um <laughs> yes good song then the angel said, do not be afraid. Jesus is not here, he is risen. Well, I don't see Jesus over here. Me neither. Maybe we should look for him. He's right there. Yeah? Well, I think Jesus might be somewhere here on the stage if somebody or people want to take a little look for him. Oh, he's there. Well, I mean, at one of these little things. One of those is hidden, kind of. Yes. Maybe in this direction. It's it's actually not. I yeah, we've got him kind of in that corner. I think. Okay, we got him. Thank goodness. All right. Thank you. Because he wasn't in the tomb, so he was risen and he was found. So, the women were amazed, and they hurried to tell Jesus, his disciples, the news. But on the way, they found Jesus standing right in front of them. And Jesus said, do not be afraid. Tell my disciples they will see me soon. So the women shared what they had seen, but the disciples didn't believe him. And the disciples are these two back here. They're kind of... A little uncertain that Jesus really came back from the dead. Um, so later the disciples gathered together, trying to decide if what they heard about Jesus was true. Then suddenly Jesus appeared among them. Let's put him there. And the disciples were surprised and frightened. Why are you afraid, Jesus said. Look, touch my hands and feet. I'm not a ghost. Would a ghost have flesh and bones like I do? No. It's me. So the disciples were amazed and happy to see Jesus. Not even death was powerful enough to stop him. He had come back to life and their hearts were full of joy and hope. Even though Jesus would soon go to live in heaven, his resurrection shows God's powerful, forgiving, and loving heart. So um, I just always like having this kind of up each year around my house because um, typically everybody has kind of Christmas nativities, but in my way, this feels like a little bit of an Easter form of one. Um, and so I think we will uh, pray now, okay? All right, bow your heads. 
Um, dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, down to our earth to rise again. Um, and for allowing us to celebrate this more than just Easter Sunday and remember that he is in our hearts forever. Amen. Thanks, Jenna, for that story. I'd like to read from the last chapter of the Gospel of John, starting at the 19th verse. In the evening of that same day, the first day of the week, the doors were closed in the room where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. But Jesus came and stood among them. He said to them, Peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw the Lord, and he said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Those whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Those whose sins you retain, they are retained. Thomas, called the twin, who was one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And when the disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord, he answered, Unless I see the holes of the nails made in his hands and can put my finger into those holes they made, and unless I can put my hand into his side, I refuse to believe. Eight days later, the disciples were in that house again, and Thomas was with them. The doors were closed. But Jesus came and stood among them, Peace be with you, he said. Then he spoke to Thomas. Put your fingers here. Look, here in my hands. Give me your hand. Put it into my side. Doubt no longer, but believe. Thomas replied, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You believe because you can see me. Happy are those who have not seen and yet can believe. There were many other signs that Jesus worked and the disciples saw, but they're not recorded in this book. These are recorded so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing this, you may have life through his name. Thank you, Ken. The uh, change <clears throat> in the Acts passage, if you see that in the bulletin, that was my uh, a bit too ambitious um, expectations of what I'd get done. So I think there's plenty in John 2. With that, he is risen. <laughs> right, Easter continues. Really, since we're an Easter people, Every day is an opportunity to live out the resurrection, the reality of Easter. Yes, Easter is a day that we celebrate, but Easter is also a season in the church year. It begins with, well, Easter and concludes 50 days after Easter on Pentecost Sunday. So, I decided I'm going to change it up a little bit. So my usual, the Lord be with you greeting is going to change to, he is risen through Oh, sorry, I interrupted. He is risen through Pentecost Sunday. Yes, I got to stay on my toes too. So last week, it started at the tomb. 
We trace the journey of Mary and two disciples is that as they moved through different emotions, despair, bewilderment, joy, and hope, the resurrection puts God's stamp of approval on all Jesus said, did, and taught. Death has been defeated, and the kingdom of God is truth. And in John's telling of the story, we find that the invitation to journey from despair to bewilderment to joy to hope, well, that's been extended to us as well, even in the midst of our own questions and lack of understanding. Because of the resurrected Jesus, we see and believe we can be confident that God's kingdom is the truth, and while we live in the tension of that kingdom here and now, and that kingdom yet to come, we have hope. Hope because of the Easter resurrection, when God displayed authority over all the powers and principalities of this world. John continues the story, the impact of Easter in today's passage, from the second half of chapter 20. See, in the second part, the disciples, as a group, they're still a bit shaken. Maybe they didn't trust what Mary told them about how she saw Jesus and talked with him. Wouldn't be that surprising. Not because Mary shouldn't be believed, but just because even at that time, uh, women's testimony wasn't admissible in court. So for some reason, maybe they didn't believe her. Peter and the other disciple, they had most definitely, they'd given the other disciples their account of the empty tomb and the grave clothes lying there inside. But even after hearing from all of them, Mary, who they should have believed, and Peter and the other disciple, this whole group of disciples, they were still worried and fearful of what the Jewish authorities might do to them. I think that's part of John's theme. John's theme of seeing and believing and yet not always understanding. The disciples, they're struggling to make sense of it all, and, well, that's understandable. Things, we, we find them together behind locked doors in this passage in fear of the Jewish authorities and what they might do. And it's right in the middle of that place, the place of fear and worry and unknowing that Jesus shows up. The resurrected Jesus, is he's no longer beholden to the physical barriers that we are. He stands among them in a very real physical sense. Only no one had to unlock the door to let him in. It's the ultimate party trick, walking through walls. Jesus is the first ever to succeed and last. When he shows up in the room, Jesus' first words are, peace be with you. And, well, his second words are, peace be with you. And, Seems like all throughout the Bible, these words are typical. It's a typical greeting from angels as well. Peace be with you. Don't worry. Don't fear. Why are you afraid? Or don't be afraid. All these encounters tell us that whenever they, meaning angels, or Jesus post-resurrection shows up, the atmosphere with the group suddenly changes. They have to say something to comfort whoever's there because of how scared they are. Now, it's not exactly the same, and I'm certainly no angel or resurrected Jesus, but I think I understand that just a tiny bit. Not the walking through walls part, but the part about the mood of a group suddenly changing. But for me, it's not fear. It's usually more like someone just destroyed all the fun people were having like letting the air out of a playground ball in the middle of recess. I remember this one specific time, it was shortly after Anne and I were married. We had some family members that liked to take quads riding in the desert or on the sand dunes near the ocean. And Anne and I would meet up with family members and on their trips there was usually a group of their friends and then their friends' friends and their friends' friends' kids and Anyways, that went on, and you get that. But sometimes the group would get fairly big, and everyone would pull their trailer or RV out to the sand, and they'd form a circle with all of them, and the tow vehicles, and there would be a bonfire in the middle, and 
on one of these trips, Anna and I arrived early in the day, and we, were, we only knew a few people in that big, fairly big group. We'd spent the day taking turns, riding out, and watching the big fancy machines and custom buggies driving around. It was now late in the day after dinner, and the sun, when the sun went down, people usually brought around a, a chair and gathered at the fire. Stories of the day were replayed with various levels of exuberance. Sooner or later, people would make conversation, and since I was a newcomer, they'd go out of their way to include me, which was wonderful. But that also meant sooner or later, someone would ask the typical get-to-know-you question. So what do you do for work? I've learned that my answer to that question can have a dramatic impact on the mood of the group, especially the mood of a group out for a weekend of relaxation and party, especially with the camping in the dunes and sitting around a bonfire after a long day of four-wheeling group. So my answer, oh, I'm a pastor. It would suddenly pause anyone who heard my answer to pause waiting for the punchline. Then when no punchline came, there'd be this look on their faces, like they were trying to replay all the events of the day and conversations and things that they said, trying to remember if any of it was incriminating or what they might need to apologize for now. I certainly had no expectation of that, but my answer, I'm a pastor, would sometimes be followed by Another question. So are you staying the whole weekend? <laughs> Over the years, I've learned to reassure people in that situation by saying something like, but not that kind of pastor. Usually there's some kind of, oh, to signify understanding, or a, a sigh of relief. People would go back to whatever they were doing before but really, I mean, what other kind of pastor is there? I'm still not sure what they think I mean when I say not that kind of pastor. But for whatever reason, I've learned that even if no one has any idea what that means, those words are somehow reassuring to people. I assume it's because they feel a bit less like I've been judging them all day, which works for me since judging people is definitely not what I'm there to do. So Jesus shows up in the locked room with all of the disciples, and he has to start off by reassuring them. His presence just there causes things to change, change much better than when it's just my presence. So he says, peace be with you. Jesus then shows them the marks he bears from the crucifixion, his hands, and those marks, they're still there as evidence that Jesus is who he says he is, and he went through what he went through, physically, the crucifixion. I mean, think about it. If God could raise Jesus from the dead, I'm sure a couple of scars could be well taken care of as well. But instead of fixing the scars, instead of repairing Jesus's physical body to a state where the crucifixion never even happened, Jesus continues to bear the scars by choice, intentionally. The disciples were filled with joy, and again, Jesus has to say, peace be with you. And then Jesus commissions the disciples to continue the work of God's kingdom and breathes on them the Holy Spirit. Eight days later, there's another encounter, this time between Jesus and Thomas, doubting Thomas. He wasn't there in the room the first time, and he doubted the resurrection. He made that obvious. So Jesus shows up again behind locked doors for Thomas, sets his doubts at ease, and again, Jesus' first words are, peace be with you, because he's got to settle everybody down when he shows up. And seeing Jesus and the scars and it doesn't say whether Thomas really touched them or not, like he said he needed to do, but just seeing them, <clears throat> Thomas professes, my Lord and my God. It's interesting that at the time scholars believe John was written, 
the emperor at that time. He had the title, my Lord and my God. It's as if John is very clearly saying, Thomas is professing Jesus as Lord and God and not the Roman emperor. With this statement, my Lord and my God, it's followed by another one of John's famous seeing and believing passages. Well, it's easy for us. And I came across this week preparing today. It's easy for us to get focused on all of the details of Jesus' post-resurrection appearance. <clears throat> the implication of those details, yet we can miss the larger point when we focus so much on those. It causes us to ask questions about the post-resurrection nature of Jesus' body. Is it purely spiritual, which allows him to walk through walls? Is it as physical as it was before the resurrection? What does it mean that the disciples are told they can forgive or not forgive somebody? Did Thomas actually touch Jesus' scars, or did John just forget to mention that, and it was just seeing that was enough? <clears throat> we can find the Thomas part of the story wonderfully comforting. I do. <coughs> that in the midst of doubts, Jesus shows up. That doubts do not prevent belief, and in fact, are the foundation, can be the foundation of belief. We, even with our doubts like Thomas and fear of the disciples and disbelief, our lack of understanding, we are welcomed and invited to follow Jesus just the same. But in this post-resurrection passage from John, I think we do well to remember just a, a couple of big picture items. First, Jesus' appearances all provide further witness to the resurrection. These appearances are proof, confirmation of the reality of the resurrection. He is risen. He is risen. <laughs> Just making sure you hadn't gone to sleep on me. Um, the one thing that no one can control, death, God has the power over. That means God is, well, God with power over even the most definite of experiences. That means God kingdom, God's kingdom is the kingdom. The way Jesus lived and taught shows us what God's kingdom is about. Loving others, loving God, loving your neighbor. Jesus used his power to benefit those around him who were in need. Well, who's my neighbor? Yes, even that person, especially that person that you hope wouldn't count as your neighbor. Jesus' appearances serve to further support the reality of God's kingdom and the power and authority that come with that kingdom. That's the first big picture item we learn, that all power and authority belong to God. Post-resurrection appearances further confirm that. Second, these post-resurrection appearances, Jesus is commissioning his followers to go share God's kingdom with whoever they meet. More than 50 forms of the word send appear in John, John's gospel. The authority and power over death that's established through the resurrection is not just for Jesus' sake, to bring Jesus back to life, but to add confidence and authority to the task set before the disciples. Confidence in the sending just as Jesus has been sent by God, so now the followers of Jesus are sent to share the powerful reality of God's kingdom of truth. Truth that we serve a relational God that went to the most extreme lengths to make it possible for us to have a right relationship with God and with each other. That's the truth of the gospel. And there will come times the disciples question their commissioning, their being sent. But their confidence in the resurrection of Jesus will always remind them, can always remind them, of the authority that rests in the truth of God's kingdom. Third, being commissioned to bear witness to the reality of God's kingdom is no small task. And the disciples 
well, they're not exactly equipped to do it on their own. Not because showing others the love of God is so necessarily complicated, but because they're imperfect people just like you and me. They don't understand everything completely just like you and me. God can and does use people just like that. And it's through the presence of the Holy Spirit that the disciples continue to bear witness to God's kingdom. Jesus empowered them to bear witness to the kingdom by breathing the Holy Spirit into them to act as a helper and guide. And finally, fourth, the same confidence in the resurrection. The commissioning, the empowering through the Holy Spirit, that extends to all followers of Jesus. Jesus was the original sent one. He was sent through the Father's love, which reveals God's purpose to save the world from its blindness and unbelief in the power of the kingdom of God. Jesus' sending his disciples extends his work as the sent one. Having been sent, it's this empowering muscle of ministry based on the prior action of God, God the Father and the Son. And now that ministry continues through the followers of Jesus today, perhaps even people like us. Through the resurrection of Jesus, we are invited to be the sent ones. We're invited to live out the kingdom of God that we've seen through the actions of Jesus, but Jesus' example won't contain every single situation that we come up against. The world was a very different place 2,000 years ago. Jesus didn't have access to smartphones or TikTok or Twitter, just to name a few. There are many situations that Jesus' example doesn't specifically address, but like the disciples, we've been empowered through the gift of the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us as a community and as individuals. And we do have the word. These all aid us and guide us in faithfulness to God's kingdom. We are Easter people. People of the resurrection. Through the power of the re resurrection, we, like the disciples, even if they're fearful and locked in a room, you've also been sent to carry on the work of loving others in such a way that it will cause them to ask questions because it doesn't make sense how much we love. They'll ask questions to which we can only answer Jesus. And while that task might seem challenging, we're not left to figure this out all alone. In addition to the Word of God, the Spirit of God is with us, guiding and directing us toward faithfulness to God's kingdom all along the way. Voices Together, the Purple Book, number 588, for our response. 588. <laughs>
can keep those purple books out, turn to 987 as our response and prayer this morning, prayers of the people. 987G we'll be reading. I was once told, you want to know the heart of a congregation, pay attention to their prayers. I'll read the part that's in regular text. If you read the bold part, and then there's just a couple of places where it says open prayers. When we get there, feel free to speak out loud uh, whatever concerns or prayers you have. 987G. Morning, noon, and night, call out to God who hears your cry. Give your burden to God who will be your support. Loving God, we bring our prayers to you with confidence in the name of our sovereign Jesus, God of mercy. We pray for ourselves and those dear to us. God of mercy, we pray for our community and for our neighbors, for our schools and school boards, Those caring for the elderly at Hope Village. God of mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for the church. For Vita Felice in Bolivia. God of mercy, we pray for the world. The conflict in Ukraine and Russia for just immigration policies. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for any other concerns we carry in our hearts. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Let's stand together for the benediction this morning. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Let everyone who listens answer, come. Let all those who are thirsty, come. All who want it may have their water of life and have it free. The one who guarantees these revelations repeats this promise. I will indeed be with you soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. You're dismissed.